Okay, well now we're going to go ahead and start Unit 2. And Unit 2 is going to have the same format as Unit, unit 1. And when we get to Unit 3, it's the same format. I like to have my classroom very consistent, and I like to do things the same. That way there's no question on what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. Would we have homework, no homework? The answer is yes. Whatever we did from the previous unit, we're going to do it very similar to every other unit. Now we're on unit two, which is matter. Okay, we have five little um, video notes to go through. And then we'll have our unit notes where I'm going to take the notes and write them down. And then we still have our CK12 reading and quiz, just like we did on the previous unit. So let's go ahead and let's start with the first one. Properties of an chemical explosion changes. explosion of fireworks is an example of a chemical change. Describe what you see that indicates a chemical change. The chemical properties of matter describe its potential to undergo a chemical change. Chemical properties include flammability, pH, reactivity with water, toxicity, and bonding characteristics. The physical properties of matter describe the characteristics that can be measured or observed without changing its composition. Physical properties include density, melting point, boiling point, and conductivity. A chemical change occurs when atoms are linked together in new ways to form new substances with new properties. Examples of chemical changes include wood burning, rust forming, and photosynthesis. The process of plants converting carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight to sugar and oxygen. There are four signs that a chemical change has occurred. They are color change, formation of gas bubbles or odor, formation of heat, and formation of a precipitate. A precipitate is a solid that forms when two solutions are combined. Certain words indicate a chemical change. These words include burn, oxidation, and combustion. Chemical changes are also called chemical reactions. When a different substance is produced than what was present at the start, a chemical change has occurred. A physical change is a change in matter involving size, shape, or state without making a new substance. Breaking glass, wadding up paper, and ice cream melting are examples of physical changes. In some cases, you can undo a physical change. Dissolving salt in water is a physical change. Water molecules surround the positive sodium ions and the negative chloride ions, dissolving the salt in solution. Although the salt is dissolved, no new substances are formed. You can evaporate the water and the salt will be left behind. Phase changes or changes in state are physical changes. Melting, evaporation, condensation, and sublimation are all examples of physical changes. Sublimation occurs when a solid changes state directly to a gas. As substances change state, the arrangement of particles changes. Matter changes its physical state when it absorbs or loses energy. Energy is absorbed by a substance when it changes state from a solid to a liquid, a liquid to a vapor, or a solid to a vapor. Temperature increases. Energy is released by a substance when it changes state from a liquid to a solid, a vapor to a liquid, or a vapor to a solid temperature decreases. Some words that indicate a physical change include tear, rip, dissolve, shatter, and cut. Physical changes do not change the substance. The state of the matter may change, but it keeps its own properties. Ask, did the chemical composition of the substance change? If the answer is no, then it is a physical change. If the answer is yes, then it is a chemical change.
All right, let's go to the next one. Hopefully you have your notes in front of you. You've printed them out. Extensive and intensive. Okay, we need to understand what those words mean. And chemistry. Both of these pots of water are boiling at the same temperature. What property determines when water starts to boil? Does this property depend on the amount of water in the pot? A system is a specific amount of matter or a part of space that is being studied. The parts outside of the system that aren't being studied are known as the surroundings. A system can be open, closed, or isolated. In an open system, both mass and energy are allowed to enter and leave the system. Consider an uncovered pot of boiling water that is selected as a system. Because energy in the form of heat is allowed to enter, and mass in the form of steam is allowed to leave, the pot would be considered an open system. In a closed system, mass is not allowed to enter or leave the system, but energy can. If a lid were put on the pot, then the steam would not be allowed to leave, but heat would still be allowed to enter. Because mass is not entering or leaving the covered pot, the system is considered closed. In an isolated system, neither mass nor energy is allowed to enter or leave the system. An example of an isolated system is a thermos. The lid to the thermos prevents mass from entering or leaving the system, and the thermos's insulation prevents any energy from entering or leaving as well. A system may be composed of many parts. For example, this system of boiling water is made up of both liquid water and water vapor. A system can be characterized by its chemical and physical properties. The physical properties of a system are further classified as intensive properties and extensive properties. Intensive properties are properties with values that are not dependent on the amount of matter in the system. Extensive properties are properties with values that are dependent on the amount of matter in the system. Density, melting point, boiling point, pressure, and temperature are examples of intensive properties. A change in any of these properties does not indicate a change in the amount of matter. Mass, weight, volume, and length are examples of extensive properties because a change in any of these properties indicates a change in the amount of matter. An easy way to determine if a property is intensive or extensive is to imagine dividing the system into two equal halves. If the property of each of the halves is half of the original property, then the property is extensive. If the property of the two halves is the same as the original property of the undivided system, then the property is intensive. A state is a set of measured properties that completely describe a system. If one of the properties in the system changes, then the state of the system also changes to a different state. A system is in equilibrium when the properties of the system don't change. If the temperature of the system is the same throughout, then the system is said to be in thermal equilibrium. If the pressure of the system remains constant with time, then the system is said to be in mechanical equilibrium. If the chemical composition of a system remains constant with time and no chemical reactions occur, then the system is said to be in chemical equilibrium. A process is a change in a system from one equilibrium state to another. If the system goes through a process where the final equilibrium state is the same as the initial equilibrium state, the process is called a cycle. All right, let's go to the next one. The next one is states of matter. 
Um, please make sure that you're filling in all the blanks as well as answering the questions and you need to turn it in on the due date, which is on September the 8th by 1 p.m. No later than that. When a substance such as water is heated, its temperature will either increase or the substance will undergo a phase change. What will happen when this water reaches 80 degrees Celsius? What will happen when this water reaches 100 degrees Celsius? Under normal conditions, pure boiling water cannot get hotter than 100 degrees Celsius. Once water boils and begins to evaporate, the temperature of the water remains constant at 100 degrees Celsius as long as the heat from the burner flame is being transferred to the water. The three common states of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. Solids have a relatively high density and rigid shape. Because the particles are so tightly packed, solids can be difficult to compress and difficult to expand. Solids do not take the shape of their container. Solid particles have a strong attraction for each other. Liquids have a high density and will take the shape of their container. Because the particles are still relatively close to each other, liquids are difficult to compress and difficult to expand. Liquid particles are attracted to each other, which tends to keep them in a liquid state. Though all particles are in motion, gas particles have greater motion than either liquids or solids. They have a low density and will fill their container. There is very little or no attraction between gaseous particles at normal temperatures. Because the gas particles are so far apart, Gases are easy to compress and expand. One phase of matter can change to another phase by absorbing or releasing energy. When water boils, it absorbs energy. The absorbed energy allows the water molecules to overcome the attraction between liquid particles and the liquid changes to a gas. This is an endothermic process. When a substance freezes, energy must be removed or released to slow the particles. This is an exothermic process. When the particles slow down, they are more likely to attract each other. On the other hand, when a substance melts, energy must be absorbed to disrupt attractions between particles. This is an endothermic process. All phase changes either absorb or release energy. A heating and cooling curve, or phase diagram, shows the relationship between energy added to a sample and its temperature. The shape of the curve can be used to find the melting and boiling points for a sample. Do you see two places on the graph where the slope of the curve is zero? This is where phase changes are occurring. Between points A and B in this heating curve, Solid ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius absorbs energy and is heated to its melting point, zero degrees Celsius. Both the heat and temperature of the sample increase between points A and B. This is an endothermic reaction. At point B, the solid ice has reached its melting point at zero degrees Celsius. This is endothermic. Between points B and C, the ice can absorb more energy and melt. Notice that between B and C, the graph is flat with a zero slope because the temperature is not changing. On the molecular level for most substances, particles become less organized and further apart during melting. The reverse of melting is freezing. This is exothermic. At point C, energy is absorbed and the ice is melted to liquid water. Between points C and D, increased heat causes the temperature of the water to rise. As temperature increases, the kinetic energy of molecules increases, movement increases, and there is less attraction between the molecules. The temperature increases until the boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius, is reached. At point D, the liquid water reaches its boiling point, 
100 degrees Celsius, and it boils between points D and E. Notice that between D and E, the graph is flat with a zero slope. Energy is absorbed, but the temperature is not changing. On the molecular level, particles become less organized and farther apart, which causes them to change state to a gas. Condensing is the reverse process of boiling. It is an exothermic process in which energy is released. As a gas, the sample may absorb still more heat and increase the temperature of the water vapor. This is known as a superheated steam. On the graph, this rise in temperature occurs between points E and F. Superheated steam is so energetic that it can even light a match. The three states of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. The heating curve shows how a sample of water changes from a solid to a liquid to a gas. The temperature of the water sample increases as the water absorbs energy over time. The slope of the heating curve indicates whether the sample is changing phase. A phase change occurs when the slope of the curve is zero. All right, let's go to the next section here. Let's see. Mixtures. Classifying solids, liquids, and gases may seem pretty easy, but how would you classify something like jam? Is it a solid or a liquid? Explain your thinking. There are literally millions of different kinds of matter. Just as all matter is classified as solid, liquid, or gas, all matter is also classified as either a pure substance or a mixture. If matter is a pure substance, then it must be either an element or a compound. If matter is a mixture, then it must be either a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. This lesson will discuss mixtures. A mixture is a combination of matter that is not chemically bonded. Mixtures do not have a definite chemical makeup. Salt water is a mixture. A mixture of salt and water could contain 0.1 grams of salt and 100.0 grams of water, or it could contain 10.0 grams of salt and 100 grams of water. Both of these mixtures are salt water, but each has a different composition. A mixture can be separated into its components by physical methods such as straining and filtration. Distillation is another way to physically separate a mixture. Distillation is a physical process used to separate a solution by adding heat. Many heterogeneous mixtures have a non-uniform appearance. Some examples are dog food and pizza. Heterogeneous mixtures may also contain matter in different phases, such as a sample of ice and liquid water. Ice floating in water indicates a difference in density, which can be used to identify a heterogeneous mixture. Homogeneous mixtures are also called solutions. All solutions are composed of one or more solutes and a solvent. Solutes are present in smaller quantities compared to the solvent and are dissolved in the solvent. Water is called the universal solvent because it dissolves so many substances. Solutions may be gaseous, liquid, or solid, and they are so completely mixed that their compositions are uniform. Examples of solutions include gas mixtures such as air, solids dissolved in liquids such as a salt-like copper 2 sulfate dissolved in water, and solid solutions of metals such as bronze, an alloy of copper and tin. True solutions are completely transparent and have solvents that are gases or liquids. True solutions are transparent because the dissolved particles are so small that they do not scatter light. The Tyndall effect helps to distinguish between true solutions 
and a class of heterogeneous matter called colloids. When dispersed particles cause light to scatter, they exhibit the Tyndall effect. Colloids exhibit the Tyndall effect. True solutions do not. Colloids are a class of heterogeneous mixtures that have particles that remain dispersed in the dispersing medium. Fog is a colloid that has liquid water suspended in air. Jelly is a colloid that has solid gelatin particles suspended in liquid fruit juice. Spray paint is a colloid that has solid paint particles suspended in petroleum gases. Suspensions are similar to colloids in that they are heterogeneous types of mixtures. However, in a suspension, the dispersed particles are so large that they will eventually settle out. Suspensions include some foods and material that must be shaken before being used. Concentrations of solutes or mixture components may be reported in percentages, parts per million, or parts per billion. In the earlier saltwater example, the amount of salt in the mixture was reported as a percentage. To calculate a percentage, take the part to whole ratio for the selected component and multiply it by 100. Components in a sample of steel might be reported in parts per million. If a type of steel contains 0.015 grams of vanadium in a 50.0 gram sample of the steel, then the sample contains 300 parts per million vanadium. When calculating parts per million, you multiply the part to whole ratio by 10 to the sixth. Some components are reported in parts per billion. If the wastewater from a chemical plant is found to contain 0.0014 grams of lead in a 2,500 gram wastewater sample, then what is the parts per billion of lead in the wastewater? Calculate parts per billion of lead by taking the amount of lead and dividing by the total mass of the sample. Then multiply by 10 to the 9th for parts per billion. The solution is 560 parts per billion of lead. All right, let's go to, I think it's the last one. Don't forget to answer the questions, fill in all the blanks, right? This is gonna have a due date and it will count as a grade. Chemistry is the study of matter, its properties, its composition, its reactions or changes, and its structure. Why do you think it is important to classify different kinds of matter? Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space or has volume. It is a coffee cup, the hot coffee in the cup, and the steam rising from the coffee. The air all around the cup is matter too. So what isn't matter? Things that are not matter do not have mass. They do not have volume. Heat, sound, and other forms of energy are not matter. Neither are emotions like love. All matter is classified in one of two ways. Matter is either a pure substance or a mixture. If matter is a pure substance, then it must be either an element or a compound. If matter is a mixture, then it must be either a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. This lesson will discuss pure substances. Pure substances are either elements or compounds. They have a definite or constant composition. The chemical makeup of a pure substance is the same regardless of the source. Pure substances cannot be physically separated. Elements are all listed on the periodic table of the elements. They include metals like magnesium, metalloids like silicon, and nonmetals like chlorine. All of the elements are classified as pure substances because they are all composed of atoms that are the same. Every copper atom is fundamentally like every other copper atom. Oxygen atoms are like other oxygen atoms. Copper atoms, however, are not like oxygen atoms. 
and the elements that they form have different characteristics. Elements cannot be broken down by any physical or chemical process. They are the building blocks for other matter. Pure substances may also be compounds. Elements are composed of the same kind of atom, but compounds contain different atoms bonded together. A compound has a chemical formula. Salt is made up of sodium and chlorine atoms that are chemically bonded in a one-to-one -one ratio. Salt has the chemical formula NaCl. Because elements and compounds are pure substances, Anything from the periodic table of elements, or anything that can be written by one chemical formula, is a pure substance. Examples of elements are lithium, silver, and sulfur. Examples of compounds are water, carbon dioxide, and sucrose. Pure substances have a definite or fixed composition, regardless of their source or how they are produced. The gas methane, CH4, is a pure substance that is a compound found in deep underground pools. Methane